Good morning, everybody. Um, hopefully, my presentation will follow on the theme from, uh, from Darren and from Brian, uh, because we have been working very closely with Network Rail and indeed TfL for a number of years. Uh, and I've been working, I say, with Darren uh, on these types of projects um, since, I think, 2012, uh, when he was in, in TfL. Um, what I'm going to run through today will follow that, so hopefully that, that same theme, looking at some of those drivers for change, uh, with particular regard to sleepers in the track infrastructure. Uh, look a little a bit at the composite strategy within network rail that has already been in place for a number of years. I'll, I'll then introduce the, the psychic composite sleeper, looking a little bit about performance first, because as Brian's highlighted in his uh, presentation there, a product has to work if it's then going to deliver any benefits around carbon and sustainability and indeed value. Uh, I'm then going to touch on one of Darren's uh, questions that he raised right at the end there, you know, the cost of this, you know, pounds versus the planet in that, and look at cost and value um, versus the planet in that way. Um, but I then want to finish a little round on, on quick wins. So we, we talk a lot today about what we're trying to get to in 2030 or 2050. There are things that we can do now that can start to make a change today. And there are certain aspects of, of products that can be used to make a change to infrastructure that has been planned and installed uh, over many decades. So looking briefly at those, Darren has talked about Network Rail's environment strategy. They're not alone, but they do have a very uh, thorough and integrated strategy looking from now out to 2050. Uh, and they've also built on that uh, with more recent work with the DFT around uh, this whole life carbon uh, modelling approach uh, using PASS 2080 uh, as the piece to do that, which looks at carbon both through the uh, embedded carbon in the track infrastructure, installation and maintenance and disposal end of life. Uh, as Darren has, uh, has highlighted. And, and this is something that's not waiting till you know, 2030 or 2050 to be implemented. Network Rail are implementing that by 2023. So this is something that they're moving much more quickly to deliver, which is, uh, which, which is encouraging. Um, and I've used a similar graph. You've seen this from, from both Darren and Brian, but just to focus to highlight this point, that the sleepers and sleepers with the clips and, and pads is about 30% of the embodied carbon in the track infrastructure. So it's an important aspect to consider when one's looking at decarbonising uh, in that way. Uh, Brian has obviously already talked about rail and the work that's being done to reduce the impact of that. And he's importantly highlighted that it's increasing the length of life uh, of those products in the infrastructure makes a huge difference um, in that regard. But there are other things that are affecting uh, railway sleepers as well um, in, in the infrastructure. The first one of those was the use of creosote which actually has been banned in Europe since 2003, but Network Rail has committed uh, and did that in, in, in July of last year and ceased uh, the use of creosote treated software sleepers on environmental and health and safety grounds for, for that purpose. Um, but they had a strategy in place, as we'll talk to deal with that. Uh, the other component, looking at timber rather than the concrete, is the rest of the timber sleepers used in track are hardwood sleepers. Uh, and I hadn't realised this, to be honest, that, that all hardwood sleepers pretty much for network rail are bought from Brazil. So we're importing here in the UK Brazilian hardwood at a time where we are challenging the president of Brazil to say he can't chop the rainforest down. These are fundamentally uh, wrong things to be doing. Um, and never really understood this. And so this is something they've been working on. This is not new. They developed and have had an asset enhancement, composite materials and track strategy for a number of years. Um, and, that's, and they're not alone in that context. They've been working with the ISO and, and European Standards Committees uh, to look at new technologies in the, in the sleeper world. And indeed, a new standards have been developed. There's a new ISO standard for, for polymeric composite sleepers uh, and SNC bearers and transoms that has been developed and is now published uh, so that rail industries or rail asset owners around the world can use these standards uh, to be able to test and evaluate products to confirm and ensure themselves that they do actually work uh, and deliver the performance necessary. Network Rail has taken that and they developed their own new standards for composite sleepers uh, in the track and SNC bearers and that's uh, 039 and that's now but was a draft, advanced draft published uh, standard for that piece as well. Uh, and then they ran through a, uh, a composite tender uh, for both uh, longitudinal timbers and sleepers uh, in 2019. Uh, which is where Psychic came on the, on the scene uh, under a framework agreement uh, as the sole supplier. Um, so now looking a bit about the Psychic Sleeper, and I'll talk about that. I know obviously a lot about that as a particular product, but these are fully developed TRL9 well-proven products. They're installed around the world in more than 20 countries in six continents. Um, and uh, they've been installed in Europe since, since 2013 and, uh, and more recently uh, with Network Rail, as Darren says, since 2021. TfL were a little bit further ahead, and TfL installed uh, the first composite sleepers in, in 2015, um, having a proven evaluation of them at that time. So there's plenty of data in Europe, even more in the US, 
uh, where we've had seizures still since, since 1996. So there's a lot of data now to demonstrate what Brian was alluding to, this idea of performance over a long period of time. Um, importantly, for carbon footprint points of view, for a UK rail infrastructure, these products are made here in the UK, um, just up the road in Middlesbrough. Uh, we also manufacture them in North America, in, in Kansas, but manufacturing these products in t locally for the local market. Uh, they're made of recycled plastic materials from the local regions to, to supply these products. So it's UK plastic waste manufactured into UK products to supply the UK rail network. Um, designing for reliability and going back to, um, to Brian's point about going right back to the early stages of the design process. In, in going through these, we have followed, you know, we did these you know, 20 years ago, but we follow the basic principles of, of Network Rail's design for reliability, uh, and we have been through that in spades with Network Rail over the last couple of years uh, to ensure those meet all of those compliance. So going through DFR, Hazard, uh, and all these other processes that are necessary to deal with that. Uh, lots of independent testing now to, to, to these new ISO standards, but also to those standards that you're familiar with for concrete and, uh, and timber sleeters, so the EN 13481 and, uh, and 13416. Dan is one well familiar with in that point. But nowhere else, not alone, um, and uh, right across Europe and right across the world, uh, these um, national and, and local standards are being developed for these types of products, uh, and we've worked with, you know, with Deutsche Bahn, Network Rail, OBB, et cetera, on, on, on those points. Uh, and also you know, com being compliant with the US standards for heavy freight. So having products that work at all different uh, load classifications is important, uh, particularly here, and Brian again talking about the use of you know, increased freight on the networks. Do these products work under heavy load uh, uh, as, as they do under light loads for the, uh, for, for the, net, for the uh, public transport systems? So the Cycle Sleeper is fully, in, in, is fully approved and installed around, around Europe. Uh, it's got a Deutsche Bahn General License, it's got a, a Traffic Burkett License, and as you heard from Darren, it'll uh, shortly have a, a Network Rail uh, full product acceptance uh, on that piece. And, and testing uh, around, around all of these communities um, to, to meet that uh, right up to, to Category E, not just focusing on the, uh, on the, on the 25 tonne, but also the 30 tonne uh, axle load requirements. There are already nearly 5,000 of these in the, in the network rail infrastructure today in a range of different uh, applications. That was under the trial PA uh, and the full PA is saying now by the, by, by the end of March. Just, just some examples of this uh, in King's Cross here and as part of the, um, of the redevelopment works there. You know, and these were short-ended short and chamfered sleepers, so dealing with those complex environments that you get on the network. Um, uh, this was one that received quite a lot of publicity um, at, at Sherrington, a viaduct product there, project there where um, the, the viaduct didn't have the capability to take the, the weight classifications of, of concrete sleepers, but also required guardrails to be applied to that. Uh, spot replacing sleepers in different strategies. So this is one in Wales where they were replacing all uh, you know, um, rotten uh, sleepers in an element of track. Um, or you're adopting the one in three and the one in five uh, strategies for, for spot replacement with uh, softwood um, sleepers. There's another one in, in the northwest. Um, but also on the public transport. So one's looking at both network rail and heavy and the public transport side. So uh, TfL approval was granted in 2015. Uh, we've installed thousands of sleepers and SNC bearers into the TfL network over the years. Um, and we're supplying all of the, SNC, the sleepers and SNC bearers into the DLR Becton project uh, at the moment. Uh, and then a range of European um, uh, users as well um, uh, to, to balance that through in, in, in Germany, Spain and Italy, for, for example. Um, and a range of advantages that have been identified, and this is not just about the psychic sleeper, although these are now more specifically about you know, psychic composite sleepers because they've been uh, evaluated and assessed in that way. So uh, you know, highlighting, and this hopefully will ring through in what Brian was saying and Darren was saying earlier, so increased durability longer service life, no degradation of those materials through life, reduced manual handling uh, risks associated with those. These all have a carbon impact uh, running through those as well, um, as they do on a, on a value uh, argument as well. Um, spot replacement, standard sleepers to use in different configurations with check rails, with, um, uh, you know, with, with third rail um, uh, in that piece as well. You've got no risk associated with, with these materials around, around electrification, around electrical conduct, conductivity with third rail or signalling, etc. within that piece. Plenty of opportunity for prefabrication. Again, other ways to look at saving carbon through that installation phase, which, uh, which carries a heavy burden on that uh, as well through that, uh, through that process. Um, so now looking more specifically um, at the decarbonisation effect of these uh, and sleepers in track, you've seen some figures from, from Darren. I've got other figures here which, you know, they're largely the same. 
uh, on these, which is, which is helpful and encouraging. Um, and, and Darren made an important point about these numbers have to be validated if they're going to have any value. Um, to, uh, to, to planning systems. So the needs for, and Darren mentioned the EPD, the Environmental Product Declaration, uh, which is a declaration made against EN and ISO standards, and that's the EN standards, the same as past 2080 uh, in the way that it's structured, um, and they are externally validated. In fact, they have to be doubly validated uh, as they're put together. Um, and that provides something of value to Network Rail and other asset owners to be able to make those calculations in an effective way and in a comparable way so you can see which elements of that process are included uh, in, in that piece. Um, but these numbers are big when you look at materials uh, that are made of recycled plastics uh, in that piece, and particularly when they're made uh, in the country in which they're installed. And you're looking at substantial savings, you know, 200,000 kilograms of CO2 just in the track infrastructure compared to a, um, to a wooden or a concrete sleeper. Uh, it's five or six times that value uh, when you're talking about the whole life to the past 2080 embodied carbon because you've got to look at in that little stepped graph that, that Brian showed again. You've got to count that every time you put in the install uh, on that piece as well. So these numbers get very, very big, uh, very much quick, more quickly if you have products that last uh, a long time in track. You can also look at the uh, opportunity for reduced carbon through logistics movements. So you've got a lighter product. If we're comparing with a G44, 100 kilograms for a composite sleeper with a, with a base plate compared to 300 for a, for a concrete sleeper, you're looking at 16 fewer lorry loads per kilometre on that. These start to add up and build up into those calculations. You look at a sleeper with a different profile. You're looking at a thinner sleeper, delivers the same type of performance as a concrete one, but it's only 130 mil, not 250 mil deep. You're using less crimp ballast. That's less ballast, that's less transport of that ballast to site, again reducing your carbon, but also reducing your cost. So again, Brian said, quite rightly, that the value and the carbon, when you look at whole life cost and whole life value uh, models, are, or tend to be very, very similar in, in that piece. Darren talked about, uh, talked about delivering the circular economy in this piece. Well, you know, how do you do that? And how do you do that when you're looking at 50 years? Um, many people talk about the circular economy of bottles, your milk bottle whizzing around the cycle. It's a five-week cycle at best with a week in useful application. Take that same milk bottle and recycle it into a composite product in the infrastructure. So my turning waste into tomorrow, today's waste into tomorrow's infrastructure model. You're doing that over decades of use. It's still five weeks going down a recycling cycle, but then it's in use for five decades, not one week uh, on that point as well. So real value. Can we do other things with this as well? Can we help address plastic waste prol proliferation by using recycled plastic products in the infrastructure? Big impact on that, six million uh, plastic bottles per, um, per kilometre of track. That's a lot of bottles going into track instead of concrete or timber. Can we start to reverse deforestation now? Why are we waiting to 2030 to reverse deforestation? Why are we still buying sleepers from the rainforest when we could be using UK plastic waste to do the same thing? So, the, and whilst we have committed to that in, 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 at COP26 last year, out to 2030, deforestation in the Amazon this January was worse than it has ever been in the last 15 years. So, so it's, a huge, it's a huge change. So onto this point of cost versus the planet. Two different graphs there, same components. Um, in the 30% in the embodied carbon is in the sleepers. You then look, across the, look at the installed cost of that, only 12% of the cost of installation is in the sleepers. And only 10% is in the rail, yet it's 41% of the, uh, the carbon uh, footprint of the, uh, of the track infrastructure. So if one can reduce, or even by spend more on the rail, spend more on the sleepers <coughs> marginally, it has a modest impact on overall cost, but a huge impact on the carbon footprint of the, uh, of the rail. And that's just looking at day one cost, not at value. But of course, value is the driver. And these are the, the, the four priorities for CP7 for the OOR. Cost doesn't appear in there once. Value does as the fourth priority. Value, greatest value over the course of their operational life is the focus. And so one looks at that analysis, and Network Rail has done this analysis looking at that value, uh, and they've done that for the psychic sleeper versus hardwood, and they've shown an annual, an annual saving through life of 40 to 57 uh, pounds per, per sleeper through, the, through that period. That's two to nearly 3,000 pounds saving per sleeper by using a psychic sleeper today rather than a composite, uh, rather than a wooden sleeper. Um, and that's six to 800 million saving if that's done throughout CP7 just for the 60,000 wooden sleepers that are used per year uh, at the moment of that infrastructure. So uh, TFL, was, it was even better. 
So now I've had my two minute warning, so I'm going to get to the, the quick win bit at the end. One of those quick wins offered by a product today that has been approved and evaluated by Network Rail. We can reduce carbon footprint, sorry, reduce cost, whole life cost, by four, nearly four and a half million per kilometre uh, running through that CAT 3 to 6 track uh, changes in, in CP7, but actually starting, starting today. We reduce that carbon footprint in that same piece of track by you know, 1,200 tonnes of CO2. We use 6 million bottles per kilometre of waste plastic bottles from the UK waste stream to do that same thing. Fewer, fewer deliveries, fewer um, impacts around use of ballast. We improve health and safety around lower weight products. No, no uh, creosote within those as well. And we start delivering against the, the, the COP26 uh, commitments to reverse deforestation today. There's a lot we can do today. And going back to the theme of this conference, it's a climate emergency, but what is the excuse to wait? And I regularly hear there's an excuse to wait. Um, and we're looking for something different. We're looking for the next strategy. We're focusing on, you know, on 2050. But why not do these little things today and start making an impact today without waiting? Um, and it's something that Network Rail and Darren, I know personally, and, and Brian on these, are driving these very hard. And I see Hannah in the audience as well. You know, these guys are trying really hard to get these, uh, th these opportunities there for the, for the network to use. Um, and now really it's for the network and the users to start taking advantage of what the technical authority and network have done and indeed what Tech <coughs> Transport for London have done to, to see that impact uh, in the infrastructure immediately. Thank you very much. Thank you.